Hey, everyone. So as you heard, my name is Matt Scales. I'm with the Web Developer Relations team at Google. Today, I'm going to talk to you about creating media on the web. So you heard earlier from Tal about how there are billions of users coming online and how the mobile web is a great way to reach them. One of the things those users are going to want to do is to create and share media. Now, the web has always been a great platform for sharing, sharing what we're doing, things that we've found, things that we've made. You just post a link to whatever it is, and anyone can just click it and go straight to it. But until very recently, creating photos, recording videos, editing and filtering these results was pretty tough, if not impossible. Now, thanks to some pretty good progress over the last couple of years, you can do all of this on the mobile web right on the device. New APIs have uh, landed that let you create rich media content. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about the challenges that are still being worked on, and I'll look ahead to some even more exciting things that are coming in the future. But first, I'd like to introduce Jenny and Peter from Instagram, who are going to tell us how Instagram are using these features on the mobile web today. Thanks, Matt. Instagram's mission is to strengthen relationships through shared experiences. As we continue to connect more of the world, our biggest opportunities are in emerging markets, countries where more and more people are starting to use the internet through mobile devices. To this end, Instagram is investing in mobile web support. Where to make it easier for people to use Instagram where devices have limited storage or connections are unreliable. As a media-heavy application, how do we deliver the Instagram experience within the limitations of web? Today, we're going to share some of the best practices. Most of you probably recognize Instagram as a native application. What most of you probably didn't realize until this conference is that starting this year, we started building out our mobile web experience. This is Instagram.com. Thanks to the existence of new APIs, Chrome will prompt you once certain criteria are met to install a progressive web application like ours to the home screen in the background. Now I'm going to show you a demo of our progressive web application. Here's a native app that you're familiar with. Like the native app, you can see that the progressive web app gets its own icon. When you click it, it loads the same experience as Instagram.com, but without looking like it's in a browser. This allows users, particularly in emerging markets, whose phones or connections may limit them from downloading, using, or wanting to use a native app to get a true app-like experience using our web product. You have stories. Um, and you have the content you follow with the people in the feed. And you can take photos as well. So I'd like to take a photo of all you lovely people. Can we get the house lights on, please? All right. And then you can see that we have the filters. So let's post this. Not the best at swipe. And share it out. And there you go. Um, so. <laughs> Back to slides, please. Oh, thanks. Now we're going to talk about the technical details about how we implemented several of these features. Specifically, we're going to deep dive into how to add your progressive web app to the home screen, video playback using adaptive streaming, image capture and filters on web, as well as offline support. One thing to note is that the majority of the features we're talking about today is Android only. However, because our target audience are emerging markets, and emerging markets are almost exclusively Android markets, this didn't really limit our reach. So let's talk about how to get the phone to prompt us to add to home screen. There are a few requirements to make this work. First, you need a web app manifest like this one. The required fields are name, which is used in the prompt, short name, which is used on the home screen, start URL to load, 
and the icon that's used on the home screen. In addition, you need to have service workers registered on your site. For this, we use Workbox, a set of libraries and abstractions for service workers that Jeff talked about yesterday and Eva mentioned as well. And this is registered through register um, router.register.route. As a prerequisite for using a service worker, your site must be loaded in HTTPS, something we are already doing. And finally, the person coming to the site needs to trigger an engagement metric. Right now, Google has it set to 20 to 30 seconds on the site for the prompt to trigger. For testing and development, though, you don't want to be waiting 20 or 30 seconds every time. So you can get the um, prompt to trigger without the engagement metric by going to Chrome flags and then turning on bypass engagement check mode. This is what the prompt looks like. Unfortunately, it doesn't allow for much customization and doesn't display information about what you are adding. Now, Owen did mention yesterday that there's a new add-to-home modal flow coming, but since that isn't available yet, and despite requiring an additional click, we implemented our own modal to give more information to users before having Chrome prompt them. In order to accomplish this, we added an event listener before registering the service worker. This event listener listens for a before install prompt event and prevents the event from triggering. And then instead of and then instead saving it off to be triggered later. So we deliver a modal, and when the user clicks add, we then show the Chrome prompt, which was previously deferred. And that's how you can give your mobile web users the feeling of being a native app. Now, Peter will talk about how we made this experience more engaging with optimized video performance. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. In areas where network resilience and reliability issues are commonplace, video playback is generally a poor experience. You have a choice between a low-quality video or a higher-quality video that buffers and stalls. One solution for this experience is adaptive bitrate streaming. With ABR, the video is broken up into a sequence of segments, where each segment is encoded in multiple bit rates. Here we have high, medium, and low. A manifest is then created, which contains detailed information of each segment and how to fetch it. Now, using the segment, the clients are then able to decide either to switch a, to a higher or lower bit rate, depending on current network conditions. Now, our first step of integration was to choose a client-side player. We were looking for something that was open source, supported open standards, and was extensible. We found Chaka Player was a great out-of-box experience great out-of-box solution for our initial experiments. So in this video, it's a comparison between our existing video player on the left and a Shaka player on the right. They're actually playing at the same speed, but you can see the video on the left buffering and stalling as we transition to 2G network conditions. The adaptive video, on the other hand, is able to continue with smooth playback. Now let's look at how we integrated. So this is a standard integration you'd create a new Shaka player instance and pass it a video element. You then load the manifest file that I described earlier. So with this approach, there's actually another round trip just to fetch the manifest file, but we wanted to avoid this. In our case, before even creating the Shaka player, we already had the manifest content, so we had to approach this a little differently. Fortunately, Shaka has a plugin system available. We create a custom networking plugin in this case. So we came up with a scheme here, it's IGW, where the video ID is in the path. We then get the manifest content from an existing store using the video ID. We then create a response with the manifest content and return it through a promise. Finally, we register the, our custom scheme through the networking engine. Going back to the integration, we simply load the player with the URI with the custom scheme that we created earlier, and we're done. So we obviously wanted to measure the impact of ABR, so we tested with three different variants. First, there's default Shaka settings. This is just vanilla Shaka. And then we added our custom settings, so we added some overrides. And finally, we added a custom ABR manager. So in the second variant, one of the properties we changed was the switch interval. 
the switch interval is the minimum amount of time before switching bit rates. We wanted to test how a more aggressive switching strategy would impact user experience. In the third variant, we added our custom ABR manager. So this gave us a lot more flexibility. With the custom manager, we had more control over how we measured bandwidth and when we switched bit rates. In the feed page, we actually have multiple instances of Shaka Player at any given time. Now that we had control over how we measured bandwidth, we also could keep track of the latest measurement. Using a feedback loop, we can then pass that back in to newly created Shaka instances, ensuring we have an accurate default bandwidth. We try to follow some best practices during these experiments. In our feed, we made sure to only instantiate players when needed and to actively use the destroy API when we didn't. We understood that it would take some time to find that sweet spot for how frequently we'd switch or how much we'd buffer. Either being too aggressive or too passive would change results. And finally, we are mindful of the types of videos that should be supported. Instagram has videos as short as three seconds. So depending on the video, it might not make sense to support ABR. While we expect to continue to iterate on our experiments, in general, we have high hopes for ABR and its positive impact on user experience. Now Jenny is going to talk about our experience adding image capture and filters. When we started working on the Instagram mobile web initiative at the beginning of the year, it was important to us to bring the mobile web users into the ecosystem of Instagram. As you heard in our mission statement earlier, we are looking to strengthen relationships through shared experiences. It is difficult to share experiences simply by watching other people's experiences. You need to be able to create an, uh, media that captures your own experiences as well. Since this was one of the first features we added, we're actually not using the newest APIs, which Matt will be talking about in a little bit. We're simply using the image capture tag, the image input tag. Yes, I'm sorry, the input tag. This is what it looks like. Now, it's also possible to add a capture field, but we purposely left this out so that the user can either upload the photo or take their own. We originally launched the creation flow without filters so that our mobile users could start sharing their experiences as soon as possible. But since filters is an important part to the Instagram brand, it was important for us to implement it as well. We use WebGL to implement our filters. Since our native app uses OpenGL, we're actually able to reuse the same shaders, which let us bring over the same exact filters as the app. As you can see, though, the filter previews are done differently. This is because it is too slow to calculate and load all the filters, so we use a standard balloon image no matter the photo. At Instagram, like with Peter's video experiment, we A-B test everything before launching. So when we, we put out filters to some percentage of users, and we actually found that several of our key metrics dropped significantly. When investigating why, we considered a few different UI flows, including seeing if there was a way to test whether or not the balloon images themselves were the problem. But then we took a step back, and we decided to test an even more basic assumption. We took our control, which was the creation flow without filters at all, and then we tested a variation where we did all the WebGL processing in the background with no user-facing changes. This test taught us a lot, because this variation took the same hit in their metrics as the variation with the user-facing filters UI. The performance hit of WebGL was what caused the metrics to drop. So our next step was improving the performance. We started with logging the timing of everything. Instagram always crops photos into a square, and we learned that creating the initial crop was a significant bottleneck. Specifically, we're doing it with a computationally ex expensive data URL and blob conversion. Since the WebGL rendering context.txt image 2D accepts an HTML canvas element, we're able to return a canvas directly, and WebGL will read that canvas as the source pixels of the texture, like so. When the user is done selecting the image, then we can render a canvas.2 blob, which we found to be two times faster than canvas.2 data URL, and then, then generate the data URL from the blob. This reduced the time to first WebGL draw by 35% and reduced the time to transition to the next step of the flow by about 85%. 
And this was just one of our performance improvements. Another performance improvement we did was to lazy load all of our shaders, which are our filters, and compiling the, instead of compiling them all up front. This was our original code. And as you can see, we would create all the filters on init and then return them when we needed a filter program. We refactored the code to create a helper function, and that would initialize the filters that don't exist already, and only calling them when a filter was needed. This reduced load time by about 68%. These performance improvements really improved our filters experience, bringing filters to our mobile web users. Next, we made sharing work even while offline. Peter will talk about why and how we made this happen. So I know this is the second last talk, but for a moment, let's imagine you just arrive at Chrome Dev Summit. You're super excited to hear all the talks and see all the demos, and you want to share this experience. So you take out your phone, take a photo, maybe a selfie, and you hit share. Unfortunately, the request times out because all the access points near you are completely overloaded. But it's OK. You can turn off Wi-Fi, and then you use your 4G, and you're good to go. But what if you couldn't simply do that? What if that wasn't even an option? What if every day was like being stuck at a conference with really bad Wi-Fi? When we think of offline support, we don't think of someone getting on an airplane. We think of someone who deals with poor network conditions as a part of daily life. In those moments when they really want to share their experience, there is so much friction right now. So let's look at a demo of how we're trying to solve this. So here we have the PWA you saw earlier. And uh, let's, let's go offline with the airplane mode. So we get a toast telling us we're offline, but we can still post. So let's uh, post a photo. <laughs> yeah, add some caption, maybe offline demo. <laughs> <laughs> And we get a toast telling us that when we connect again, it will be posted. So let's go back online again. Uh, let's go back to the slides and see how we did this. So first, we wanted to notify the user that they're offline. So we listened to the offline event. Um, the offline event actually is a little bit unreliable. For some phones, battery save mode is actually considered an offline state. So it'll actually get triggered. To guard against this, we added a lightweight get request to ensure that we're truly offline. And then on error, we, we show the toast. With Workbox, as Jenny mentioned earlier, we then register a post request route. Uh, service workers can't cache post requests, so you actually need to store the request in a client side store. Here we use IndexedDB, where we break down a request object and store it. We create an offline post helper function that will reconstruct the request that we just stored earlier and send it. We then use the background sync API that was mentioned in earlier talks. Now, earlier in the demo, if it worked, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, would, we were um, planning to send the, the sync event manually through DevTools, uh, which would have then triggered the sync event. So in practice, uh, it depends on the device to actually trigger this, this event, and it's based on a number of conditions. So in the callback, we then check if there's any items in the queue, 
And then we call our offline post helper and show them the notification. So as you can see, recent advances in the web have enabled us to create a uh, feature-rich experience for mobile web users, especially those in emerging markets. We're actively testing the features that we cover today and are continuing to iterate and learn along the way. It's been incredibly challenging, exciting, and humbling to work on features and handle cases that we might not think about in our day-to-day. -day. We mentioned shared experiences several times during this talk, so it was really great to be able to share our experience building out these features. I wanted to give a shout-out to our teammates who aren't on stage with us. They've all done amazing work to get us to this point, and we hope to continue the momentum we've already built. And now back to Matt, who will describe the latest APIs for media creation. Good job. <clears throat> cool. Thank you, Jenny and Peter. Uh, so we've seen some of the web, what the web can do, and it looks pretty great. But we can do more with new APIs. So one of the things that uh, Jenny mentioned is that Instagram are delegating uh, image capture to the input element. You can actually do this inside your app. Now, it used to be a little bit limited. We've had access to the camera for quite a long time through Get User Media, uh, which is part of WebRTC. Um, it allows you to get a stream from a camera or the microphone or, or both. <clears throat> uh, and it's a pretty simple API. Um, but you couldn't really do too much with it before. You could use it for WebRTC, which is what it was designed for. Um, but other than that, you could present it back to the user using a video tag, or you could uh, grab an image from it. Uh, and the way you do that is that you take the video, uh, the, you take the stream, you put it into a video element as the source, then you draw the video, one frame of the video, into a canvas, and then you take the canvas and turn it into a blob, and then you get the blob and you turn it into an image, which is pretty long-winded uh, and was also just limited by the APIs because get user media, those streams are limited to 1080p HD regardless of what your camera can do. But we now have a new API called the Image Capture API, which makes this a little bit uh, easier and uh, much better. So it takes the stream that you get from Get User Media uh, and gives you a new object back, uh, an image capture object. And it gives you a take photo method. And when you call this, it tells the, uh, the physical device, the camera, to take a full resolution uh, photo and just give you straight back a blob. So none of this drawing to canvas nonsense in the middle. You also get some extra options. Uh, so you can see here that in this example, uh, I'm passing through a fill light mode setting. Uh, this is setting what the flash should do. So here I'm saying that the flash should be set to auto. Uh, you can also set um, the uh, automatic red eye reduction through this method. Similarly, for audio and video, there's the media recorder API. Again, you take a get user media stream, you pass it in, uh, and you say what mime type uh, of output you want. <clears throat> then you get uh, a data available event every time that the, uh, the, that the recorder has buffered up enough data to give to you. And at the end, you can uh, reassemble this all up into a blob for either the video or audio file that you were creating. And as well as using Get User Media to get these streams, you can also get them straight from a canvas or from uh, web audio. So this is how you do things like live filters. You could take a, a video, draw each frame into a canvas, apply your filters, and then use a stream from the canvas to create a new video, which is the output. And you could, if, you're, uh, if your canvas was applying like Instagram's filters, you could get a filtered video out on the other side. Now, not everything here is perfect. There are still things that we need to work on. One of the issues that you'll have trying to do these things is simply device performance. I mean, as I said, you know, uh, Tal has been talking about how uh, we have to, uh, many of the users that are coming online um, have uh, devices that aren't the same as the devices that we use. They are, you know, many of them are not as uh, powerful. And things like drawing Instagram's filters are extremely computationally intensive. There are also limitations in the APIs themselves. <clears throat> So as an example, let's talk about something that I tried to do. Um, 
So I wanted to create a boomerang effect. What I wanted to do was take a, a recorder video with a media recorder straight from the camera, and I wanted to then create an output video which played the video forwards and then played it backwards again, and then it would loop. It's called a boomerang effect. So I tried to do something that was pretty simple. I'd play the video, and uh, on each frame, I would set where I, in the video I wanted to be in that frame, and I would have it, uh, you know, as soon as it got to the end, it would set the uh, direction to minus one, and it would come back again. And then the idea was to record this with Media Recorder. And it's awful. It's trash. Uh, this is a video that I took, and this is, this is the, the full quality that I got. The, um, it's extremely jerky. It's difficult to tell exactly when it's going forwards and when it's going backwards. <clears throat> why, why did this happen? <laughs> there are a couple of reasons. One of them is that uh, at the moment, when you use Media Recorder to record a video, uh, the output the, is in a WebM, which is optimized for streaming. And this means that it doesn't put in the index of where in the file each frame appears. Um, it just assumes that you're going to play it through uh, right from the beginning, and then it will just um, iterate through the file. So if you want to seek, then it has to go right back to the beginning of the file and work its way through until it finds the correct location. There are some optimizations. If you're playing forwards, then it can make a rough guess. Uh, oh, you got to this far, and it was this time, so it's somewhere after there. But going backwards, um, you have to start a game from the beginning. <clears throat> it also means that you can't do the simple, even simpler trick of just saying, uh, set the play rate to minus one, uh, because that also doesn't work. It would have the same issue. You can fix this with a library, but which will take the, the video that you've created and uh, actually manipulate the bytes to put in that, uh, that index information so that you can then make it seekable. But it's pretty low level. It's a pretty chunky library. Uh, it would be better if the web platform did this for you. <clears throat> Another issue is that recording with Media Recorder is always real time. So I thought I could fix this issue by taking uh, the video, lining up exactly where I wanted to be, and then saying to the Media Recorder API, hey, I want one frame. Just record one frame, and then wait until I'm ready for the next one, and then say, OK, take another frame. But it doesn't work like that. It always records exactly real time. So if it's janky when it goes into your canvas, then it will be janky when you record it. It also means that if I tried to take a one-minute video and do a boomerang of it, it would always take exactly two minutes to create. I can't do it faster than real time, either. Um, so it's not a perfect solution right now for some of the things that you might want to do. But of course, we want to see the web, uh, the mobile web, as a great platform for media creation, so we're working hard to address all these things. Another new thing that's coming uh, that we're looking forward to is WebAssembly. You heard about this earlier from Alex. Um, one of the things that this allows you to do is take native libraries, uh, recompile them for the web, and then uh, use them in your page. And people have been, already been experimenting with native uh, video libraries like FFmpeg to do media manipulation on the web. Video doesn't appear to be. Oh, well. We're also excited about the Shape Detection API. This lets you detect things like text, barcodes, and faces inside an image. This is currently behind a flag, um, but Francois Beaufort uh, demonstrated this at I.O. earlier and actually had a demo out in the forum area, which you might have seen. I see people taking pictures, so I'll just wait a moment. <laughs> the things that we've been talking about here. Uh, I've been creating a sample application that I've called Snapshot. The source code is available on GitHub. And I've been documenting my experiences in a video diary, uh, which is available on YouTube. In summary, um, I think that what com companies like Instagram are doing with media on the web is incredibly cool. I hope you're all as excited about the future for this uh, as I am. And thank you very much for coming.